Okay, well, good afternoon, folks. Uh, this is Bill Costanzo, Livestock Guardian Dog Research Specialist at the AgriLife Center in San Angelo. I want to thank you for uh, logging into our, um, our webinar for this quarter. Um, oh, just a, a couple quick things here before I, I turn it over. I do want to thank the uh, Sheep and Goat Predator Management Board uh, that provides funding for my position. Uh, Dr. Redden, the, the center director, for providing leadership for us. And then also Robert Pritz uh, for helping uh, get the webinar set up, as always. Um, I, I always appreciate that support. Our sponsor for today is uh, Lone Star Tracking. Uh, if you're looking for any type of GPS trackers, uh, reach out to Lone Star Tracking and they can get you set up. Uh, if you have any specific tracker questions, um, you know, feel free to contact me here at the AgriLife Center and, and I can help you out with that. Uh, just a, a couple housekeeping things. Um, you know, we'll answer all the questions at the end of the webinar as usual. And uh, oh, if for some reason your mic isn't muted, muted already, if you could please uh, make sure that your mic is turned off. So with that, uh, I'll introduce our presenter today. Um, we have uh, Carrie Stewart Parks with us. Uh, she's an internationally known forensic artist and law enforcement instructor uh, working on major criminal cases throughout the nation. Uh, she's also an author and, and best-selling um, novels in mystery, suspense, and uh, thriller genre, and uh, has garnered a bunch of different awards for her, her novels. Um, oh, she's been involved with the Great Pyrenees breed since 1959, initially with her parents, and she inherited the, uh, I hope I say this right, Carrie, the Skeel Kennels. Um, oh, when her mom passed away, uh, she was raised and is still living on a ranch in North Idaho and has seen firsthand, um, oh, livestock guarding dogs working both on the ranch and, um, oh, in uh, oh, dog shows. Uh, at the urging of her fellow breeders, uh, she fulfilled all the requirements to become an AKC Great Pyrenees judge and has been awarded the AKC's medallion for 25 plus years of serving in that capacity. In 2022, uh, she was chosen to be a judge um, of oh, more than 100 entries at the National Specialty in Chicago. And throughout the years, she has contributed her art and talents to the club through various committees and, and different projects. Uh, following in her mom, uh, oh, Evelyn Stewart's footprints, uh, Carrie became president of the Great Pyrenees Association and received her 50-year membership pin at the 2022 National. Uh, she just stepped down as a board member and currently serves as a chair of the judge's education. So with that, Carrie, I'll go ahead and uh, I'll turn over the, the presentation to you. And uh, as I mentioned, we'll, we'll get all the questions at the end, ma'am. Well, thank you very much and thank all of you for joining me here today. What I'm going to be presenting is what's called the judge's education. This is what we show prospective judges who want to know more about our breed. And it goes into form and function. Where do the Pyrenees come from? Why do they look the way they do? Why are they structured the way they are? Now, some of it is specific for judges as far as a variety of different things but it does get into what we're looking for in a Great Pyrenees as far as temperament and the working ability. At the very end is a montage of different Pyrenees in different uh, roles. And I originally put it to music, but I absolutely cannot get Zoom to do anything with my music. So you're just gonna have to hum something when we get to that point. So, to move on, I'm going to now share with you the Judges Education PowerPoint for the Great Pyrenees Club of America. Well, welcome to the Great Pyrenees Club of America's presentation of our standard of perfection. The Great Pyrenees is a breed going back in written documents hundreds of years with fossil deposits dating to the Bronze Age between 1800 and 1000 BC. It's one of the number of large, primarily white, livestock guardian breeds that are believed to have originated in Central Asia. The descendants of the mastiff-like dogs developed in the breeds we know today as the Great Pyrenees, Kuvas, Akbash, Anatolian, Marima, to name just a few. The great dogs of the mountains found their way to the Pyrenees Mountains between Spain and France. Here in this remote, rugged, and isolated region, 
The breed developed into the regal and majestic breed we know today and call the Great Pyrenees. Appreciated by the peasant shepherds for their courage, strength, and intelligence, they were utilized as guard dogs for their flocks to protect them from the wolves and bears, as well as human marauders in the Middle Ages. Having an excellent sense of smell and exceptionally keen sense of sight, they were the invaluable companions of the shepherds, their worth being counted equal to two men in protecting their flocks. Armed by nature with long, thick, heavy coat, they were additionally protected against attack by a broad iron collar with an inch and a half spike. Spikes. They became such an unbeatable foe that the breed became known by early writers as the Pyrenean wolf dog or hound and the Pyrenean bear hound. The charms and beauty of this ancient breed endeared them to a young Dauphine of France, later to become Louis XVI, and he took a young Patou, the generic name for the males of the breed, to his residence. Thus, the Pyrenees became the court dog of France. No respectable chateau was without at least one great Pyrenees. Royalty came and went, especially in France, and it was so in the remote Pyrenean mountains that the breed continued to flourish. Living closely with man, they developed a kindly and devoted disposition, yet still retained their outstanding guardian qualities. They are highly intelligent, but independent thinkers. By the way, that's Pyrenees speak for the fact that they have intermittent hearing loss when you say words like come or no. They, uh, that's that independent thinking that we like to talk about. Records tell of the transportation of Great Pyrenees to the Biscay fishermen in Newfoundland in 1662 to guard the settlement. But the actual arrival of Pyrenees to the United States came in 1824 when General Lafayette sent over a pair of mails to his friend J.F. Skinner, the editor of the American Agriculturalist. He said he recommended by him for personal experience as an inestimable valuable to value to wool growers in all regions exposed to the deprivation of wolves and sheep killing dogs. The breed's population in France was severely reduced by World War I. From the remaining stock, Frances and Mary Crane of Needham, Massachusetts, brought the first breeding pair in 1931. They became almost the sole importers of the breed to America in the 1930s, creating the Bascari Kennels. The breed was recognized by the AKC in 1933. In the 1935 standard of the breed, Mary Crane wrote about them. When my folks were very first married in the late 1940s, they, they couldn't afford anything. I mean, they were poor as only college students of that era could be poor, but they could afford a dog book. So they bought the AKC's uh, dog book showing all the different standards. And they read through all the standards of all the different breeds. And when they came into the Pyrenees, they read this part and they just fell in love with them. What Mary Crane had penned at that time was, in addition to his original age old position in the scheme of pastoral life as protector of the shepherd and his flock, the great Pyrenees has been used for centuries as a guard and watchdog in the large estates of his native France. And for this, he has proven ideal. He is as serious in play as he is in work, adapting and molding himself to the moods, desires, and even the very life of his human companions. Through fair weather and foul, through pleasure hours and hours fraught with danger, responsibility, and extreme exertion, he is the exemplification of gentleness and docility with those he knows, of faithfulness and devotion to his master, even to the point of self-sacrifice, and of courage and the protection of the flock placed in his care and of the ones he loves. As you view our ancient breed today, keep in mind their long and colorful history. The written descriptions of the ideal guardian dog from the Roman Empire parallels the Pyrenees current standard in terms of appearance, structure, and function. We want a dog agile enough to race across the steep mountains to protect his flock, large, powerful, and courageous enough to confront a grizzly bear, 
gentle and kindly enough to trust with the smallest of children and beautiful enough to catch the eye of a king. The Great Pyrenees Standard was revised in 1990. This was the first change since 1935, a period of more than 55 years without change. In addition to adopting the AKC standardized format, the 1990 revision remained true to the historic Great Pyrenees while expanding and clarifying the description of the breed. Present day breeders have worked hard to maintain the soundness of both structure and temperament. While the breed still works in the high slopes of the Pyrenees Mountains, they have proven to be invaluable throughout the United States to guard flocks on small farms and in the vast open range of the American West. There is only one type of Great Pyrenees. There should be no difference between the show dog and the working livestock guardian dog. Both the working dogs in this photo are also champions. And this is where I grew up. These are our dogs about to go out for a horseback ride. In fact, the show ring today may prove to be considerably more boring compared to their working environment. Whether it be sheep, goats, cattle, horses, alpacas, llamas, or other domesticated animals, the Pyrenees takes his role as guardian seriously. One of the questions that you, you meaning the judge, will want to ask yourself as you evaluate our breed is whether your entries are capable of performing their centuries old task of guarding the flocks from predators in all kinds of terrain and all kinds of weather. Moving on to the general appearance of the breed, your first overall impression of the correct Great Pyrenees should be of a large, strong, elegant, principally white colored dog of medium substance who is quietly aware of all that goes on around him. His appearance and demeanor are almost regal. In addition to the overall beauty and elegance, there should be no question that this is a working dog. Balance, proportion, and size are essential for this breed. The Great Pyrenees should be structurally balanced front to rear with moderate angulation throughout. In profile, the outline should be that of a horizontal rectangle a dog that is slightly longer than it is tall, with the distance from the withers to the elbow being approximately equal to the distance from the elbow to the ground. The forelegs are directly beneath the withers. Chest development should be verified by hand since a full coat or ruff can give the impression of more body than actually exists. The head is not heavy in proportion to the size of the dog. The neck of the Great Pyrenees must be strongly muscled and of sufficient length to facilitate movement in, com in punk combat. The correct medium length of the neck also contributes to the Great Pyrenees proud carriage and e excellence. When stationary as well as in motion, the back line from withers to croup must be level and parallel to the ground. Because of the long coat, you will need to verify that the back line is straight and strong. Show ring presentation of the Great Pyrenees stacked with a sloping back line is not correct and should be discouraged. This dog is presented correctly with a level back line. The Great Pyrenees is a large dog, but while size is always desirable, it should never be achieved at the expense of soundness or correct type. The correct Great Pyrenees needs to be large enough to face a wolf or bear and survive the encounter. Dogs should measure between 27 and 32 inches at the withers. Bitches should be 25 to 29. Even though the standard does not specify a range for weight, it's important that weight must be in proportion to the overall size and structure. The Great Pyrenees is not heavy, not a heavy lumbering dog, nor is it light and racy. The standard calls for medium substance. By that we mean a bone, particularly leg bone and muscle, need to be in balance with the total frame. This differs from the Newfoundland that is well-boned and the heavy-boned Mastiff. And when we refer to weight, a dog, especially a male dog that is in the field and working will run much lighter in weight just because they run off all that weight. As you observe the Great Pyrenees, please remember that the coat can mislead the casual observer 
in terms of actual size, weight, bone, and muscle. The coat of the Great Pyrenees consists of two separate layers. A flat, thick, coarse outer coat protects the dog from the weather and underbrush. This outer coat should be straight or slightly undulating. It should never be curly or stand off from the body. Because of the long coat, you will need to verify the back line is straight and strong. The second coat is a seasonal undercoat grown in the fall to provide warmth. It is made up of a dense growth of fine, woolly textured hair. Typically, the undercoat is shed in the spring and in the fall and in the summer and about a week after you make an entry into a dog show. Yeah, they're going to get rid of it. In warmer seasons and or climates, a less dense coat is acceptable. Females also tend to shed their undercoat after having been in season and in whelping. A dog presented in full winter coat is spectacular, but as long as the coat is the correct texture, it's the underlying soundness of the dog we're interested in. Don't hesitate to consider a dog shown in summer coat. And what we don't want is what's called a cotton coat. If you've ever shaved a dog down because somebody told you it was a good idea, generally speaking, that coat that comes back in will end up being a cotton coat and very difficult to maintain. The uh, undercoat comes out, that long outer coat will protect them sufficiently. One of the breed's points of sexual differentiation is the coat. Adult males tend to grow longer, more profuse coats with thicker ruffs around the neck and shoulders. Nevertheless, we ask that you do not ignore the bitches just because the males carry a more impressive coat. In evaluating coats, the most important concern is ensuring the overall coat is correct. The amount of coat is a secondary consideration. The Great Pyrenees coat should be presented naturally with only minor trimming allowed to tidy up the feet and face. Removal of whiskers and eyebrows is optional. Exhibitors should not be rewarded presenting a dog with a scissored or sculptured coat. Correct Great Pyrenees coat color is either all white or white with badger, tan, gray, or reddish brown markings. Occasionally you'll find individuals with markings that are red. These markings typically are located in the head, ears, body, and or the base of the tail. No marking color or location is considered incorrect. Special attention must be employed when evaluating dogs with strong head markings. As you can see in these drawings, a full face mask can sometimes distort the visual perception of the actual shape of the head. These three heads are exactly the same, and any appearance of difference is caused by the markings. Marked dogs and bitches are felt to be essential to a sound breeding program because they help maintain good pigmentation in the breed. Usually, most of the markings are exhibited on the outer coat, and most undercoats are white. However, some dogs, like the ones in this photograph, also exhibit a gray or shaded undercoat, which can cause the top coat to appear to be less than brilliant white. While no preference should be given to marked or unmarked coat coloring, it must be remembered that the Great Pyrenees is a principally white dog. When markings exceed one third of the body, they are considered to be excessive. And this dog's markings, by the way, are acceptable. It is not more than one third of the dog's coat. In the case of redhead, redhead's freckling often occurs. The Great Pyrenees is a breed of moderation and balance, angulated but not overangulated, medium substance, but neither too much bone nor too little, sufficient size and weight to enable it to perform the role of guardian of its flock, enough coat to provide protection from weather and adversaries, but not so profuse that it tangles and gets caught up in the underbrush. All elements must be in balance. As you move to the front of the Great Pyrenees, what becomes apparent is the regal beauty of the head. Its beauty comes from the soft, smooth transitions, the absence of an apparent stop, the balanced proportion of the front and rear skull, and from the unique, quiet confidence reflected in the eyes. The shape of the skull, as viewed from above, is wedge-shaped with sufficient fill under the eyes to produce an almost straight line running from the ear to the tip of the nose. The drawings on the right show the correct wedge-shaped head with sufficient fill 
under the eyes. The length of the muzzle from the tip of the nose to the stop should be approximately equal to the length of the skull stock, stop to occupant and also approximately equal to the breadth of the back skull measured between the ears. These two drawings show the correctly proportioned skull. Too short a muzzle gives a common appearance and spoils the elegant beauty of the breed. A long muzzle without adequate back skull width and depth is equally incorrect as it makes the head look narrow and snipey. The drawing of the male on the left and the female on the right are considered to be ideal. Probably the single phrase on the Great Pyrenees standard that causes the most question among newcomers to the breed is the statement that there appears to be no apparent stop. Yet this key description of the correct skull remains unchanged since the original standard in 1933. The drawing on the left shows the proper amount of stop. The dog on the right demonstrates an incorrect head. There is too much stop and the muzzle is too short. These problems often go together. When we look at the head in profile, we can see that the plane of the top skull is not parallel with the plane of the muzzle. Instead, the muzzle slopes up slightly from the tip of the nose to the point at which it joins the top of the back skull. There is, therefore, a point between the eyes where the two planes come together with a minor but not overly apparent change of slope. There should be no abrupt, sharp angle caused by the two planes not eating evenly at the stop. The key to understanding this phrase is the word apparent. While there is a point of joining, it's so subtle that it's not apparent. Said another way, the stop is perceptible but not pronounced. This dog has a correct stop and sufficient length of muzzle. In addition to too much stop, the beauty of the Pyrenees head can be destroyed by too much rear skull above the eyes. The head should be, have only a slightly rounded crown. Too much rounding or too much crown formed a dome, creating a heavy head. In addition, this dog has too much down below. There's too much jowl. It's got a sloppy muzzle. You want them both to be clean. The eyes are of medium size, almond in shape, and are set at a slightly downward oblique angle. The dark brown color of the eye contributes significantly to creating two Pyrenean expression. By contrast, a light brown or yellow eye destroys the desired expression. A correct Pyrenean eye gives the breed its unique expression, the faraway, contemplative, almost dreamy look that says, I have everything under control. It's a very kindly, well regal expression. The hair on the face and ears is shorter and finer, giving the head a soft, smooth appearance. Typically, there's a line running from the outer corner of the eye toward the base of the ear, caused by the meeting of the hairs of the upper and lower face. The Great Pyrenees ears are set at, at eye level. They are small to medium size and carried low, flat, and close to the head, almost disappearing from view blending with the fur of the rough. To assess the true beauty and correct expression of the Great Pyrenees head and eye, the dog must be relaxed with his ear low in the natural position. Therefore, judges are discouraged from whistling or shaking keys to try to make the Great Pyrenees alert, as you might with one of the terrier breeds. When you check the dog's bite, please remember that scissor and level bites are both acceptable. The photograph shows the typical mouth in an older dog. Receding lower central incisors are common and should not be faulted. The lips of the Great Pyrenees must be tight with the upper lip fitting snugly just over the lower lip, but not overlapping the bottom jaw. Pigmentation is very important. Lips, nose, and eye rims must be an unbroken black. Correct head and expression are essential to the breed. To be typical, the Great Pyrenees head must be an elegant molded wedge with smooth, soft transitions, almost as if an artist had formed it from clay. It should not have a sharp, abrupt, chiseled angle that would be more appropriate to the Cuvaz. There must also be a material difference between the profile of the Correct Pyrenees and the St. Bernard and the Newfoundland. Having completed our evaluation of the head, it's time to use our hands to get under the coat and feel how the dog is really put together. The well-groomed coat can hide a lot of faults. 
Therefore, the only way to see that if the dog is structurally capable of fulfilling its historic function is to get your hands inside that coat. This is a breed of moderation, as can be seen in the dog's breadth of back, spring of ribs, and moderately broad chest. The shoulder blades should be fairly close together at the withers with a gap of about two fingers width and lie snugly against the rib cage. Its shoulders are well laid back, joining the upper arm at an angle which visually approximates 90 degrees. The length of the shoulder blade and upper arm are approximately equal. Well-muscled shoulders and strong, flexible past pasterns allow the Great Pyrenees to absorb shock as it descends the steep slopes. The feet are close cupped like a cat's to maximize endurance and minimize injury. As your hands travel to the rear of the dog, the key consideration is the hindquarters must be in balance with the forequarters. In other words, the angles and joints in the forequarters and the hindquarters should appear to be nearly equal. The croup slopes gently down from the level top line with the tail set on just below the level of the back. Normally, the tail is carried low in repose. It should hang down so the last bone of the tail reaches at least to the hock. Near the end of the tail, it's not unusual nor incorrect to find a kink or shepherd's crook in which one or two bones angle away from a straight tailbone alignment. When in motion, the tail may be carried either over the back in an open wheel or low. Both carriages are equally correct. No preference should be given one over the other. And when a dog is going out after something, that tail is usually over their back. Pyrenees should be shown stacked with the tail hanging in a natural position. If the dog chooses to carry the tail over the back in motion, the tail should correctly make a wheel. The length of the upper and lower thighs should be equal, and there should be moderate angulation at both the stifle and hock joints. When the Great Pyrenees stands naturally, its rear pastern should be perpendicular to the ground. It's neither unusual nor incorrect to find a Great Pyrenees whose rear feet toe out slightly like this dog. This towing out is a function of the way in which the foot is attached to the leg and is different from a faulty cow hock rear where the hock joints twist together, breaking the straight flow of the bones. And the side I want you to look at is on your left hand side. So the hock is straight, but you can see a couple of the toes. The foot on the right is towing out more, probably a little bit too much. Inside each rear leg are located double dew claws. The dew claws may help with the stability while facing downward in a steep surface or facing off an opponent. They're a traditional symbol of breed purity. Be sure that you bend down and verify their presence with your hands. And do not let your vet take them off. <clears throat> like the front feet, the rear foot is rounded and close cupped. Now it's time to see how the desired structure translates into movement. Sound and efficient movement are critical to the Great Pyrenees, as they are to all breeds that must be capable of working in the mountains. Correct structure and balance provide the Pyrenees with a smooth, elegant, agile, light-footed gait built upon good reach and strong drive. This allows the Great Pyrenees to work within the flock using a quiet and flowing movement, as well as climb the mountains with agility, effortlessly patrol around the perimeter of the flock at a sustained trot, and when needed, cover short distances with great speed. The Great Pyrenees is an elegant dog that moves smoothly and efficient. It is not a flashy dog. Now it's time to... As the Great Pyrenees increases his speed, the legs move toward the central line. Neither the front nor legs nor the rear legs should move wide. In viewing movement going away, it's important to distinguish between a dog that is moving close versus the illusion of closeness caused by the presence of those double dew claws. Care should be taken that the dog is not flashy and that the speed does not infect you as a judge. Ease and efficiency of movement are always more important than speed. The temperament section of our standard is printed in bold type because it's absolutely essential that all Great Pyrenees must be totally, totally stable and gentle. 
First and foremost, the Great Pyrenees is a guardian, trusted to work independently with the flock, walk into a classroom of children, or live at home with his family, distinguishing between those situations calling for action and those offering no threat. The show ring is not a situation that should threaten the Great Pyrenees, therefore any sign of excessive shyness, nervousness, or aggression towards human must not be tolerated. In the show ring, a Great Pyrenees general demeanor should be that of quiet composure, both patient and tolerant. He is perceptive enough to know that the proceedings within the show ring are not a threat and therefore be at confident ease. And now I would like to share with you a montage of And that concludes the PowerPoint section of what we expect our judges to look for in a great Pyrenees. Well, thank you very much, Carrie. I sure appreciate that. That was uh, a lot of good information about the Pyrenees breed. Um, folks, if you've got any, any questions, um, I'll feel free to go ahead and, and put those in the chat right now. And uh, we'll stay on here for a little while uh, and try to get as many of those answered as we can. I guess while we're waiting for folks to come up with something, Carrie, I, I guess I've got a question for you. Um, oh, here they here they come. They're rolling in. Well, um, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and ask you my question. Um, how common is it for the the Pyrenees? I mean, most Pyrenees that I've seen are are all white, uh, and and so is my own dog. Um, but how common is is some of that different coloration um, within the breed that you showed in the slideshow today? Um, the, uh, it used to be that most of the show dogs were white. It was just kind of a trend. Uh, now most of the dogs carry a fair amount of color. We, it, it's pretty common because you don't want to have a white to white breeding. You end up with that, what's called a snow nose, that pink nose. Mm -hmm. Um, you want to have that, that markings. Now the markings on an adult dog can make the dog appear white, but, uh, usually they have, they are marked in some way. Um, and you, that is desirable. And so I would say 
in a ring of say 10 dogs or something like that from a variety of different backgrounds, you're going to have probably eight of the 10 marked and maybe only a couple of pure whites. Um, oh, wow, okay. So one of the questions, how large are litters typically? Well, I have to do a tongue in cheek and say that, well, if you've got 10 people waiting for puppies, you'll get a litter of one. Um, but they they normally, sorry, I got a mosquito that's going after me. Um, they normally have litters of six to 10 puppies. So they have larger litters. Um, they can and have been used for service dogs. In fact, I think the AKC gave a Pyrenees service dog of the year. It was with a veteran. Um, so they are very commonly used for service dogs. They make excellent service dogs. Um, how do they determine what is the actual standard and how much difference in the original from over a thousand years ago? Okay, so the standard of perfection is the written description of what the perfect Pyrenees looks like. And the American standard of perfection is based on the French standard of perfection. So it would have to go back to when the different organizations were coming up with what should a standardized dog look like of any particular breed. And every breed recognized by a, a host club, like the American Kennel Club or the French or the English or whatever, every breed that's recognized has a standard, a written verbal description of what the perfect dog should look like. Now, there is no such thing as a perfect dog. Okay, I know mine will all think that they're perfect, but yeah, sorry, they're not. So what you do is you're always comparing your dog to that standard of perfection to see how close, and if, uh, if they are lacking in some area, is this particular lack something that would cause a problem? For example, if you've got a dog with a beautiful head, but he hasn't got one good leg out of four, you got a problem. So you need to, that's where you work on, on your dogs. And that's why you compete to make sure that you're not blind to what's going on in your own kennel. So the American standard is quite similar to the French standard, not exactly the same, but it's quite similar. Um, yes, Pyrenees do like to, a question came in, uh, from Roxanne, I have one that wants to jump on you, but other than that, she's very gentle and lovable. Uh, yeah, they, they have different ways of greeting people. Um, a lot of times a nose in the crotch is a, is a standard Pyrenees, how are you doing kind of thing. Sort of a little surprise, but that's okay. Um, the muzzle, is that muzzle autumn? How can you tell if the muzzle is incorrect in a puppy? Um, you kind of have to know your bloodlines. Um, and no, because puppies kind of look a lot alike when they're very young, but if you've got a real saggy set of eyes and a saggy jowly uh, mouth on a dog, it's not going to get better. So you want it tight to begin with. Um, let's see. Yes, Christine. Uh, excellent. Thank you for that. Um, the structure and temperament have to support the original function. They're not a breed that has become useless. Like um, the American Cocker Spaniel are so different from the English Cocker Spaniel. They separated into two breeds and the American Cocker Spaniel as shown in the show ring could not work. He's got too much hair. He's got the wrong head and that sort of thing. We in the Pyrenees breed, we wanna make sure that the dogs that walk into the show room, show ring could also walk out and work a flock even well, hopefully with some training, but um, we want it to stay the same. We want that form and function, the temperament, the look of the dog to remain the same. How do they fare in heat and humidity? Um, so that white coat reflects heat, which does help. The coat will shed out, all that undercoat comes out and that they end up with that long, flat outer coat, which gets quite thin, but it keeps them from getting sunburned. Um, generally speaking, what they'll do is they'll dig a hole, if they're not working, they'll dig a hole, which you can eventually put a swimming pool into, or at least a hot tub, and that will keep them cool in the heat of the day, and then they will not exert themselves too much. I mean, they're like any smart animal. They're not going to be flying around in the middle of the heat kind of thing, but they, you got to make sure that that undercoat is out and that you don't shave them down. There are Pyrenees working in Texas 
so i know that they do work down there so um when it comes to, okay so i'm reading williams when it comes to working dogs do you ever see that judging will take into account their working ability working dogs doing well in a show ring doesn't equate to the ability in the field so what the the judge can't see i mean you can't bring your pyrenees into the ring and stick them on a coyote as much as i would like to do that at times um so the judge can't see that that part of the working ability but in a show ring a pyrenees should know that a show ring is not a situation to be upset to be kind of wild-eyed or whatever they should know this is a neutral situation and they should reflect that and so the judge is going by the structure and soundness of the dog because if they have the structure and the soundness and they're showing the correct temperament for that environment you have three of the factors that you need and then beyond that um, many show dogs are working dogs and many working dogs are show dogs so uh, but judges can't tell that part all they can go by is the conditioning the health and that sort of thing probably the biggest difference between a show dog and a working dog is a show dog is going to be that coat is going to be in better shape because it's groomed more often and they're bathed more often that sort of thing but our all of our sh working dogs were also show dogs uh, when kept as a pet is barking an issue inside the house at night um yeah it can be um my dogs have taken into account that thunder should be something they should bark at i don't know it's just this new thing um but yeah if if there's a sound outside that is a sound they should be aware of that's different so if the normal sounds inside your house daytime and nighttime are traffic that is not an unusual thing so basically a pyrenees works like um i say it's like a little old lady with a lot of doilies but uh, people get offended at everything but i'm a little well i'm an old lady anyway um a pyrenees has a place for everything and everything is a place so if in their world everything is where it's supposed to be so traffic noises, that's supposed to be there. People noises, that's supposed to be there. Kids screaming next door, that's supposed to be there. As long as that stays the same, they're not gonna notify you that something is different. So their barking is saying, look, there's something going on that I don't know is right. So they have to learn what is correct and what is right for their environment. Um, so that's basically how they work as guard dogs uh kayla small homestead in the rocky mountains with heavy predator load requires an acceptable stranger in a reasonable degree since we have diverse and uh and blue level children does you need temperance for it thank you uh yes um it it actually they're they're the least aggressive of all the working guard dogs um so in that sense again i'll go back to that what is normal so uh actually i'll tell you a little story uh, we placed a, an adult Pyrenees with a, a farm that had milk. They, they had milk cows and they sold milk. It wasn't a big commercial. It was a small arrangement. So they milked their cows. They had the, ca the milk in the, the refrigerator and people would come to pick up their milk at various times of the day. When the owners were there, they could pick up their milk. Everything was cool. If the owners were gone and somebody drove up to their house to pick up their milk, the dogs would let them get out of the car that's fine they haven't done anything they could walk anywhere they wanted to that was fine but when they picked up the milk the dog would go no put it back you're not authorized for the milk so they have to know what is okay and what is not okay so if that's okay um that people come to your home at thus and such a time and you greet them and they, they do have to see you you know acknowledging them or knowing that that's okay they generally they're they're actually pretty excited to see people um they're they're not gonna they're not on guard duty at that point if that's usual for them we have some more questions we have some really good questions there um we have people coming to our door at various times of the day um the dogs always rush the door and bark like they're going to eat them alive and uh, kill somebody and all that sort of thing of course if you can see the other end the tail is going like crazy so usually it's easier for me to go out another door because they do know the word um 
to stay put, to not rush the door, but they, they only know that word when they're by themselves. Remember I said that situational hearing. So uh, once I've said this person's okay, or once everything's okay, they're, they're like all over them, like a fat kid on a cupcake. They're, they, they really like people. Um, do claws and indicator of period or just have impurities in the bloodline? Okay, any breed of dog, most breeds of dogs can carry do claws. Um, but in the show ring and for the purpose of breeding and that sort of thing, the double dew claw is a sign of the breed. It's like a Labrador needs to have that thick, heavy tail that they use as a rudder or, you know, different breeds have something that is an indicator. So yeah, Pyrenees have double dew claws. I think that Commodore has them. I'm not sure what other breeds do, um, but other breeds can have dew claws. You don't want to remove them. And if you've got a dog, if you're, you know, thinking about breeding and so on, you need to make sure there's double loop claws there because um, you don't want to breed in a, a fault of that kind. Uh, William, again, I'm trying to encourage mine to stay with the sheep even more than they do. So uh, I will say sheep, walk to the sheep and give them a treat. Well, they seem to have learned that the word sheep means a treat, but not go to the sheep. And we do this wrong. Okay. Um, yeah, they, you know, they'll figure out that whole treat thing completely. Um, the dog has figured out that the sheep are okay as long as you're there. Um, and what you're going to need to do is to is to convince the dog that the sheep are part of his property they're part of his you know area whether it be walking the dog over there walking around the sheep that sort of thing um it might be that if you're handing the the treat while with the sheep the dog goes along for the treat with you maybe the treat needs to be in with the sheep without you being there uh, put it so the dog can get to it. That might be a possibility. It's it's going to be a matter of teaching the dog this is his responsibility. The effective age of working retirement for these dogs, um, they kind of slow themselves down. The Pyrenees, again, I mentioned they're the, the gentlest of all the giant guarding dogs. They also are some of the longest living of the giant working dogs. Um, they live to be 10, 12. I did see one that was 16. That's pretty unusual. Um, I would go by the dog slowing down. He'll, he'll kind of indicate, okay, you know, um, I'll, I'll catch that later. They, they kind of let you know. Um, if the dog is trying too much and he's just not getting there, um, he's kind of telling you it's time for retirement. Um, Pyrenees also mature at usually from two, I would call their prime age from two to seven with four to seven being really prime time. Um, do they get along with other animals like they do with humans? Oh yeah, they, they develop really good companionship with other animals. Um, mine like to chase cats, for example, because I have a bunch of feral cats, but if the cat stops, the dogs go, yeah, run. Yeah, you're not getting into it. You're supposed to run. So if the cat doesn't run, they just stand there and kind of sniff it. So they get along very well. They, they form companionships with other animals. They will become companions to other animals, very much so. Uh, snake inversion training recommended. Uh, you got me on the snake thing. In North Idaho, we don't have poisonous snakes. So I, I don't know. I, I, I would defer to somebody who's around snakes and what it takes to, to keep them away. They're curious about things, but I don't know about that. I would, I would defer to somebody who would know. Well, they spend a fair amount of time with the sheep, but would like to teach them if there's an issue with a stay straight document. There's just someone to go to the sheep who would have to stay with them, not leave. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> If the dog knows that the sheep are his people, that the sheep are what he needs to protect, if a stray dog comes in and does not disturb the sheep, the stray dog can kind of hang around because it's not disturbing his thing. If the stray dog comes in and starts to chase the sheep, the Pyrenees is going to take care of it because that those are his sheep 
And those are things that he needs to be aware of. Now, some dogs are roamers. They just roam a mind perimeter of what is his property. Um, but once they understand that the sheep are his, his property, his guardian area, he should drive off uh, stray dogs or at least the stray dog can hang around with him as long as it doesn't bother his sheep. That's some really good questions there. I've got another one. For uh, most of the uh, pictures. Yeah. Oh, I, I was going to, you mentioned that, uh, you know, we were talking about the coloring earlier and uh, I, I was curious for those that are logged on today that might be doing some breeding with Pyrenees. Um, the, uh, the pigmentation that you mentioned on, like on the nose and, and I've noticed also um, there can be some of that white pigmentation around the eyes. Uh, is that something that somebody that's, you know, doing some breeding of guardian dogs should, should avoid that. And those dogs maybe should be fixed and not, not bred to, to reproduce. Right. If, if you're going to uh, launch into breeding the dogs and producing working, good working, substantial Pyrenees, you want to not introduce into the Pyrenees line. I mean, let's face it, you fell in love with the breed. You like the breed. Why would you want to be individually responsible for doing your utmost to destroy it? So you want to maintain all of the best qualities. So what does that look like? It means you want to make sure that you're your the hips are x-rayed, so you're not breeding in hip dysplasia. You want to make sure the pigment is good. If you've got a really, really good uh, working dog that has incorrect pigment, consider not breeding it. Or if you do, you want to breed to a dog that carries heavy pigment. And if you have puppies lacking pigment, then you're introducing something into the bloodlines that we don't want. So you want to, if you're, if you're deciding you're going to breed, you need to think about, I'm responsible for working with a breed of dog that's been around for thousands of years. And am I doing what's right for the breed or am I just out for whatever reason it is? You want to take into account that uh, as a breeder, you're accepting a responsibility that you want to maintain all of the things that are good about the dogs and not introducing things that we don't want in the breed. uh okay so yeah food uh, dogs pyrenees can get real funny about their food um yeah it um depends on the dogs there's a lot of pyrenees i have i had uh, one female that was very very food aggressive and she taught all the other dogs to become food aggressive so they can teach each other things that are not particularly good so um Pyrenees are not really usually piggy eaters. Um, so if the dog is not a piggy eater, uh, maybe yeah, in your case, yeah, picking, picking the food up is probably your best bet. Um, you know, time to eat. You've got 15 minutes. Food's up. Back to work kind of thing. Oh, well, we're waiting for another. I, I've got another question for you. Um, could you kind of go over maybe comparing some of the specific breed traits of, of Pyrenees? Like how, I guess their guarding style is what I'm I'm looking for compared to, and, and I know that, you know, obviously you have a lot, a ton of experience with Pyrenees and maybe not as much or any with some of the other guardian dog breeds, but what are some of the, the specific characteristics that a producer would find in a Pyrenees versus say a Marema or Akbosh or, or some other guardian dog? Okay, so each of the different breeds were bred in a specific area that reflected the, the desires of the humans in that area. So in the Pyrenees mountains, their most important thing was to protect the flock from predators. They did not want a dog that was particularly aggress human aggressive, though they could be if they needed to be. If you take, uh, say, uh, a Kuvaz or some of the other breeds, they're much more human aggressive because they wanted dogs that protected the flock, not just from the predators, but from humans as well. 
Secondly, the Pyrenees first line of defense is going to be barking. That's their primary defensive tactic. They will run out, they'll rush out there and they're gonna bark. And they're gonna bark loud and they're gonna bark long and they're gonna make a lot of noise and they're gonna come at it. And they work very well together when they come at it. So they're gonna use their bark. They're not gonna necessarily bite. They're not a biting dog. In fact, they're a little bit picky about what goes into their mouth. So they're going to be um, barking to let you know that something is wrong. And then they're going to look to you, the owner, if you're there, because they do think independent. They're gonna to look to you as the owner to find out, is this an okay situation? Can they stop barking now? Um, so in that situation, they will cease barking if you indicate that, okay, it's okay for that to happen. They don't leave their flock necessarily to go out after something. So if you had a herd of a sheep and you had say two or three Pyrenees, they might tell, like, I don't know how they do it in doggy language, you go out and take care of that. You too do that and we'll stay back. So they, they work as teams with each other and the, they, they'll send one dog out. There'll be one dog maybe that's doing a perimeter. They'll have one that stays with them. So they work as teams with each other. Um, they're very, very independent thinkers. They do not, for example, you talk about obedience, you know, you teach them obedience. You tell them to sit and the Pyrenees will think, well, okay, well, I know how to sit. And you know, I know how to sit. You know, the judge probably knows I know how to sit. Everybody in this room knows I know how to sit. So I'll think about sitting, but I really think it's pointless. I mean, they do this whole thinking about it rather than actually just sit. And if they do sit, they're gonna do it in such a way that makes you feel guilty for even asking it. They'll do it slowly, maybe with a sigh, you know, okay, I'll do it, but it's stupid and pointless. So they really like to think through the situation, figure out what is correct, what is incorrect. Um, I showed you a picture in there of two children or three children actually total. Those were dogs that, uh, those were children from an enclosed classroom that my sister-in-law taught. And I took a, a dog, I just ran a brush over her. I asked permission from all the parents. I took her into the classroom and just turned her loose. And the kids were all over her. I mean, you couldn't see her at times because they were laying on top of her. And she thought she'd died and gone to dog heaven. She thought that was the most wonderful thing. You also probably saw Pyrenees that was with a nun. That was the first dog hero that we had. That was the, the Pyrenees that drove a druggie that got into a cloistered monastery in California. And they just turned the dog loose. And he learned how to not walk on water, but he walked over a fence very quickly. So they, um, uh, it's not unusual for Pyrenees to be getting hero award type of things. Um, as far as the roaming goes, yes, they, they can be, uh, they can roam. There are some that are roamers uh, and some that are not so much. Um, again, it's a matter of does the dog know the perimeter that it's supposed to take care of? And some dogs just don't learn it. It's just like some people. Some dogs are prone to doing it better and some dogs are not. And it's just, um, it's preferable if you start off with a dog that knows what's supposed to happen and you introduce a new dog, a puppy into the situation. So the puppy can learn, okay, this is what I'm supposed to do. Um, I've got two, one, I've got a roamer and I've got one that's a homebody. So it's, it's really kind of an individual dog kind of thing. Um, there's no easy answers like people. Some people are better at some jobs and some are not. Yeah, it's the incorrect uh, bonding. Okay, um, you're the lady, uh, Carrie, what a wonderful name, Carrie. Um, Carrie, yeah, your girl can go in and be spayed now. She's, uh, your pup's 12 weeks. She's uh, old enough now, go ahead and get her spayed. And when your pup reaches usually about two years, that's uh, anywhere from 15 months to two years, you can go ahead and have the pup also altered.
There was a question about snow, uh, if, if the dogs like snow. You know, I, I married my husband and he did not know Pyrenees. And he came out and he was looking out the window and he said, oh my gosh, it's, it's, you know, I'm in North Idaho. He said, it's, uh, it's like 10 degrees out there. And, and look at that. There's a, there's a two foot snow bank. We can, we need to bring those dogs in. And I said, Rick, you got to look, the dogs are sleeping in the snow. My dogs make snow angels. They run out and they, they flop on their side. They do kind of a submarine thing with their face under the snow. And then they do the snow angel with all four feet. So they love the snow. They think that snow was put there just for them. Um, yeah, they love snow. <laughs> Folks, um, oh, if there's any last questions, uh, please go ahead and post those, but we are at our, our four o'clock uh, stopping time. Um, Oh, uh, while we're waiting uh, oh, for any last questions to pop up. Um, oh, there we go. There's one about uh, climbing. Climbers are a stinker. Um, I had one that basically they're escape artists and they're really hard to get over because they're smart. They can figure it out. I ran a hot wire around the top. They'd listen to, set, to see if they could hear the sound of the electrical in it um probably just running a little bit of wire going inward might help the climbers a, an escape artist can be an escape artist they're just sometimes really really uh they're very difficult to deal with because they just want to get out and um you can try i've tried a whole bunch of stuff most of my dogs are not climbers so that's good It's, I don't know that it's so much a bloodline issue as to a climber. It just seems to, it, again, it's a lot like the Pyrenees are so individual in their, their outlook and in their personalities and so on. Uh, when we had dogs whole times when we were breeding, no one ever picked out their puppy. We picked your puppy for you because we would watch the way the dogs acted and performed and so on. And we would try to match the the dog to the family or the bloodline to the family and then there, within that bloodline there would be tendencies toward so uh, not a straight bloodline issue it's within the litter within uh individual puppy issue yeah the the mama that climbed she they're good at learning i'll tell you that you get a digger they're going to show everybody how to dig i've got a howler and they, everybody knows how to howl now so yeah, they learn very quickly from each other. I thank all of you for being so patient with me and for joining in today. Well, again, thank you so much, Carrie, for um, oh, taking some time out of your schedule to, to give us this presentation. Uh, we definitely, oh, I think everyone learned a lot about the Pyrenees and a little bit more, hopefully, that we didn't already know. Uh, I do want to thank everybody for logging on. Um, our next webinar will be uh, oh the the third third Thursday in August. Uh, I don't remember the exact date, but uh, Dr. Catherine Lord will be back uh, to talk about bonding and and canine socialization and and those kind of things. So don't forget to log on to that. Uh, just in closing, again, I want to thank the Sheep and Goat Predator Management Board for for funding for the program, uh, Dr. Redden for his leadership, and and Robert Pritz for taking care of all the uh, zoom stuff and, and facebook live uh oh posting and things like that for me uh again uh, if you're looking for you know gps trackers go ahead and, and reach out to lone star tracking that's who we use for all of our gps tracking needs on our livestock guardian dog so um with that i, I think we're gonna uh, wrap up the webinar uh, again carrie thank you so much for uh oh helping out and, and doing this webinar again for us today thank you for inviting me you're very welcome, ma'am. Well, we'll talk to everybody later. If you have any other questions uh, for Carrie, go ahead and, and shoot me an email. I think most people have my email and, and I'll forward those on to her and, and get your response. So thank you very much for watching everyone. Have a good day.